Welcome to Discovering Victory, a monthly podcast ministry where we feature life-changing messages recorded live at America's Keswick. My name is Graham Wilson, and with me today is Dr. Bill Wealthy, President and CEO. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Graham, it's exciting to see what God's going to do with this month's teaching. It is. So we are in the heart of our 2015 summer season, which the theme is Live Courageously. And uh, we've already been able to see some exciting things that God has already done in even this short pocket of time. Um, I know over the last two weeks, we had 27 kids yes. pray to receive Christ in children's ministry, which is just so exciting. Um, last week's speakers were Dr. Jamie Mitchell and Dr. Phil Tuttle. And uh, Jamie Mitchell was the morning speaker. And when he got done speaking, I think we both recognized that this particular message was really important for our viewers to, to watch. Um, why don't you tell the folks a little bit more about who Dr. Jamie Mitchell is? Well, I got to know Jamie my first summer here. He was an instructor with Walk Through the Bible. That's who Phil Tuttle is with. Uh, Jamie is a pastor of a, of a really growing church out in Lancaster County called Harvest Bible Chapel. It started out as New Song Fellowship. And it's a really neat church, lots of young families. Over 350 kids attend their church on Sunday morning. Wow. So it is really, really, really neat. And, and Jamie shared a very powerful explanation of what it means for a Christian to walk in victory. Mm -hmm. And so we sat down and we did a little dialogue with Jamie. And I want to encourage our listeners to just give a look at what Jamie has to say as he talks about the message for this month. Jamie, you shared a, an incredible series this week at America's Keswick, Unstuck. And the message that we're going to feature this month on our mm -hmm. podcast was really powerful. It's sort of like the Keswick message. Why do you believe that that message is so important for believers today? Bill, being a pastor for as long as I've been, the thing I have watched over the years is that we are so consumed with the what of sin. We're consumed with our addiction. We're consumed with pornography. We're consumed with our marital problems. We're consumed with all these things. And they're serious, I get that. But the problem is, what I haven't heard in churches and pastors and what I don't think believers fully understand is, how do we really change? And what's, what's interesting is that the guys who come here to Keswick and go into the colony and they work through this and they really have to start to understand change, when they go back to their churches like for their covenants, what they don't understand is they probably know more about actual life change than most of the Christians who are sitting in the churches where they're doing their covenants at. Mm. Because we have not been teaching people how do we change? How do we have victory over sin? What is the process God has, has outlined for us so that we secure our mind, we slay the old man, we strengthen the new man and start putting on the proper habits of, a, of what a believer is supposed to look like? And then how do we maintain that? What's needed to keep growing? And so that's the key for the message. And, and I think that's what, you know, I've been watching even at my own church and other places where I share this. It's like people are saying, I, I never knew that. I never, I was, I've been a Christian for like 30 years and nobody has told me how to change. And that's why I keep saying the how is greater than the what. I don't care what your problem is. The how that God has for you can overcome whatever what you have. And that's the power of it. So let's watch this month's podcast from the series Unstuck. And so Paul now gives the plan. And it's very practical. And if we look through the rest of, the, uh, of Paul's writings, it's consistent. It's the same thing over and over and over again. And he gives a process of change. And it's a four-step process. We're going to work through that this morning. There is the securing of the mind. There is a slaying of the old man. There is a strengthening of the new man. And then there is the staying or remaining steady with the master. So let's unpack this. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, and the securing of the mind. Paul writes this. He says, okay, you want to change? Yes, Paul, we want change. We don't want to go, oh, I keep falling back into the old. How do I get out of it? How do I get unstuck? Okay. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. 
at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Secure the mind. Now, now, yesterday we were talking about Romans 12, and one of the keys to change, I said, was the whole idea of renewing or renewal or renewing the mind. And Paul makes a note of it there. He makes note of it in Ephesians. He makes note of it in, in Philippians. All the way through Paul's ministry, renew the mind, renew the mind, renew the mind, renew the mind. If change is going to happen, if our behavior is going to be directed and influenced towards godliness and we're going to get unstuck, we have to think differently. We can be assured that, that just in and of ourselves, we are going to be rooted in ungodly, unbiblical, false thinking. The battle of the Christian life is in the mind. That's why when we were having this little sit-down on, on Monday and we were talking and it came up and I just about it came unglued because as a pastor I deal with this over and over and over. Most of the people in the church today and most of us here today, and this is not an insult, this is an observation, not an accusation, we don't think. Part of the problem is pastors don't challenge their people to become thinkers. We have to think. And Paul consistently brings up this principle, and he first identifies who he's instructing to. He says, then if you've been raised with Christ. So again, he's talking to believers here. Because believers are the ones who, through their union with the Savior, has been risen with Christ. Romans 6 tells us that we have been crucified with Christ, and that we have been raised with Christ. We identify with his resurrection. We identify with his crucifixion. And now we can walk in the newness of life. If I'm crucified, that means I was dead. And I was dead. I was dead in my sin. And my sin had to be crucified. And on the cross, Christ takes my sin. And he crucifies that sin. And so... When I am in union with Christ and I identify with Christ, when he was on that cross and he died for my sins, with my sins, my sins died with him. Therefore, I have been crucified with Christ. And when he went to the grave and on the power of God, on the third day, he rose up from the dead. Guess what? In Christ, I rose up with him. Woo! Man. Wow. I don't know what that was, but I, you know, it's because I had breakfast at the colony this morning. I'll tell you right now, that, that guy makes some great eggs down there. I'll be coming down there tomorrow for eggs. I know. Yeah, don't, don't let anybody else come down there. No, 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 no. But we have been raised with him. Therefore, we are in Christ. We are a new creation. And he says here, look at the text says, because we have been raised with him, we should therefore be seeking things above. Our whole direction has changed. And, and Paul says in Ephesians that in Christ I have received every spiritual blessing, not some, everything. Therefore, all the re spiritual resources found in Christ, I have. And we're told to seek. That word means to pursue, to go after, to grow, to gain, to discover. And he's calling Colossae not to be satisfied with just redemption and your ticket to heaven, but to grow and become perfect and complete. That's what he said in chapter 1. He says, I want to complete, I want to present you complete in Christ. So how does that start, Paul? Verse 2, set your mind on things above. Think differently. It's translated think or to anchor or to have an inner disposition so that, <clears throat> that your mind is pointed north. Secure your mind. Calibrate your mind. Fix your mind. Secure your mind on things above. Secure your mind on the things of Christ. Your mind has all kinds of things floating in it, flying around, and it needs to be secured. 
Let me show you what your inner man looks like. You do know that we have material and fleshly, and we can see that. We can understand it. There's muscle, there's flesh, there's skin, there's corpuscles, there's blood. We can test it. We can put all kinds of needles here. We can test the physical material world. But the inner man is immaterial. It is invisible. We can't see it. We don't know what, you can't control it. We can't hold it. You can't hook a stethoscope up to it. But for sake of illustration and to understand, we've got to have some kind of concept of this very, very um, um, non-concrete thing. So I, I've had to, because I, 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 I got to help myself, because I, you know, I have a photographic memory. It's never developed. So, um, <laughs> so I, have to, I have to have things that help me. And so I, I made this little cube and it really has helped me over the years because I do know the scriptures do tell me that my inner man is made up of my mind, my will, and my emotions. That's the inner man. That's what makes us unique from any other thing that crawls on this earth. We have a mind, we have a will, we have an emotion. And from that come thoughts, actions, and feelings. Correct? Correct, class? Okay. Now here's what we have to understand. All three of these things can drive us. My feelings can drive us. My actions can drive me. My thoughts can drive me. But God, in His divine design of us, has designed us that when we are working properly, there is a certain order by which those work. Feelings should never drive us. Never. Never. I, I don't... I don't want to do it. Why don't you want to do it? I don't feel like it. I don't care what you feel. Go clean your room. And some of you are saying, amen. Amen, oh, amen. Yeah, amen, Pastor Jamie. But if you came in my office and I told you, why are you leaving your husband? Because I feel like it. I don't feel good around her anymore. He doesn't make me feel good. I don't care what you feel like. You're allowing your feelings to drive you? God never designed that. Our actions should not drive us. Because we do our involuntary things and we just do things. We react. We impulse. Paul calls them fleshly impulses. And if our flesh gets out of control and I start doing things because I just want to do those things, we have a problem. And so the way God has designed us is our thoughts should dictate what we do and how I feel. And that's for saved and unsaved. Just so I help you understand it. Saved and unsaved. A healthy person, their thoughts drive their actions and their feelings. Now, just what I do know about the mind is an interesting thing. About 10% of what's back in here in the mind in our thoughts is conscious thought, and about 90% is unconscious thought. Well, what does that mean? Well, that, that's the difference between the computer screen and the memory. What's up on the computer screen is conscious thought. What's back in the memory is unconscious thought. And there's certain things that I hit, a link, a button, a, a, a code, and all of a sudden I bring what's in the memory up into the conscious thought. And I said, oh, I didn't remember I had that file in there. It's like, uh, it's like this. Um, 
see if you see if some of you can finish this. Conjunction, junction, what's your? Okay, let me just help you understand something. Five seconds ago, none of you were thinking about Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> and that show has been off TV almost 20 years. But that little tune and that little phrase was tucked in your mind, and all I had to do was start singing it, and you brought it out. That's how your mind works. Last night we were chatting like we do every time we sit out on our porch at night and we talk about you. <laughs> That's what speakers do. Uh, well, we were talking about, well, I was laughing, we were laughing about Phil's story about his, 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 uh, his uh, scorned love uh, problem when he was sixth gra in sixth grade. <laughs> And I said to him, I said, Penny Wayne. He said, Penny Wayne. I said, that was my first girl. Penny Wayne. I said, it was the church formal. We had a, a kind of an anti-prom thing in my youth group. We had a dinner and we got dressed up and I took Penny Wayne to my first youth form. And, and you knew it was true love because I was in the back of my mother's uh, uh, Mercury uh, brome and she had to drive me. Can you see how that went? And, uh, and, and while we're in the back, while, while we're sitting in the back seat, in the radio came on Stevie Wonder. You are the sunshine of my life. And I looked over at Penny. <laughs> and so anytime I hear Stevie Wonder sing, you are the sunshine of my life, Penny Wayne. Penny Wayne. She, she's been married three times since then, so it didn't, it's probably a good thing that didn't go anywhere. Um, but that's how our mind works. And so here's the fact. Back in here are all kinds of memories, experiences, and this is where all our beliefs are formed because beliefs are basically pulling together experiences and we form those strong beliefs and convictions and ideas that control us because once this controls our thought life, it controls everything in our lives. And here is the problem. Before Christ and before we know the word of God, we don't know truth and we don't have the power to overcome those things that hurt us. Because here's the problem. Here is where your father beats you to a pulp and you hate his guts. And he is continuing to control you. And until you come to faith in Christ and you understand what real forgiveness is, you don't need your father to ever apologize. In Christ, you can say, I can forgive him and I can take that thought captive in the name of Christ. And I can secure my mind because of Jesus Christ. There will be no change in your life if you don't secure your mind. Because what happens is then you see a guy like me and I remind you of your father. I say something. I comb my hair like him. I say some funny word that sounds like him. And you know what happens? Your hatred for your father pops up here on the screen. And then you turn me off or you feel the same way you did about your father and you don't want to hear a thing I have to say about the word of God. And that is how our minds work. And that is why we fall into all kinds of sin. So in this message, Dr. Jamie begins to break down the process of overcoming sin in our lives. And in step one, he talks about securing and renewing of our minds. And he brings up a very interesting way of understanding our inner self. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about more of our conscious and unconscious thoughts. Um, Bill, I know over the years you've been a huge proponent of memorizing scripture. What's the difference between reading scripture and memorizing scripture? And why do you think something like that's so important on changing and overcoming sin? Well, if you look through the scriptures, it started out with Moses talked about memorizing. Uh, Joshua, in the first chapter, and of course, that's our theme verse for this, this summer in Joshua 1.9, but, but Joshua talked about the, the, the beauty of 
hiding God's word in your heart. David was a big proponent of memorizing scripture. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at Jesus, when he did battle with the devil in the wilderness, uh, on the three questions that the enemy threw up in his face, he said, it is written. Mm -hmm. And and so I really believe that it's important for us to, to have, as a part of our spiritual weaponry, as we combat the flesh, the world, and the devil, hiding God's word in our heart. It's been that way for a long time here in America's Keswick. We asked the colony men to memorize 120 Bible verses during their 120-day stay. And the reason we do that is because as they hide God's word in their heart, as they face those temptations, God's going to use his word. He's going to bring back to their minds those things that they've memorized. I memorized lots of Bible verses when I was a kid to go to camp, Mm. realizing now that really wasn't the purpose How many times God has brought back to my mind in the midst of a situation something that I hid in my heart to help me battle temptation and to be able to walk in victory? Hmm. It's great points. Let's check out our next clip. It says here in verse 5, Put to death and therefore what is earthly in you. Why? Because you secured your mind. You know the truth. You know who you are really in Christ. You know the power you have. You can do this. That which is earthly in you. Well, what's that, Paul? Well, you know, some of you out of a pagan background, you sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these things, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to each other. Seeing that you have put off the old self and its practices. There's two terms here I want you to circle in your Bible. They are crucial if you are going to have victory and get unstuck. Put to death and put off or put away. Let's talk about put to death. He's referring to here the conscious effort of slaying the remaining sin in our flesh because though we have come to faith in Christ, we still have the old man in us. We can contain him. We can restrain him. We don't have to feed him. We can put him on the altar. Don't let him crawl out. Stick your foot on his neck and keep him down. That means to stop the behavior of sin, starve the fleshly desires, restrain the involuntary responses, and start building the right habits that reflect a new birth. Romans 8 says this, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. I think that's pretty clear. But if by the Spirit, meaning if you live according to the Spirit, for the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom, liberty. It says here, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body so that you will live. Now back to Colossians. Obviously, Paul has heard about this church and understands that there's some pagans there and there's some Jews there and the pagans are are believers. They've come to faith in Christ, but they have slipped back into their old pagan ways. The heresy has come in. The false teachers came in. They said, you know, know, they're, they're restrained. You know, if they're really true and that you've got heaven and you can enjoy heaven and you know what? That's the spirit. You know, that's separate than the flesh. Enjoy the flesh. Jesus has forgiven you. He's going to take you to heaven. Just enjoy the flesh. Be, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you may die. True or false? False. Anybody had questions about that? Because he says here, he says you need to slay those old behaviors. And he lists them there. Sexual immorality, impurity. Let me just give you a couple. Let me walk you through some of these. Immorality. It's translated immorality. It's fornication. Any form of sexual sin. Homosexuality, adultery, pornography, anything like that. 
Once you come to Christ, you need to slay that. You need to kill it. Starve it. Stop it. Uncleanness or impurity, this goes beyond the sexual acts, even encompassing evil thoughts, intentions, scheming. Your passions and evil desires, that has to do with lust. Passion, God builds passion into us. That's part of our physical being. But when our passions are out of control, they go into evil desires. Jesus said that that committing adultery is a sin, but the man who lusts, you know, that second look, and you keep looking, and you keep looking, and you start devising ways to get what you can't have, that's lust. Don't do that. Kill that thing. Take the sword out and chop the head off of that thing. Get like Braveheart. Covetousness. That's greed. I got to have it. I need it. I want it. I'm going to get it. Nobody's going to tell me I can't get it. Wrong desires. Defrauding. Wanting something you can't have. And finally, idolatry here. This is engaging people um, in the whole issue of, of worshiping, and really in this case of worshiping themselves and the selfishness that's behind sin. So uh, what does Paul say should motivate us? Well, he makes it real clear here. Look at the text. He says in verse, seven, uh, in verse 6, on account of the wrath of God is coming. Now, wait a minute, Paul. Time out. I thought when I came to faith in Christ, I was not going to, I've avoided the wrath of God. Well, that's the ultimate wrath of God. You do understand, that's the eternal wrath of God, but you do understand there are different wraths of God. And that, that, that we as believers, we may experience discipline here while we're on earth, and that is a form of the wrath of God. You understand that God may turn his wrath loose on us to teach us to get us back walking where we need to walk, and it's called discipline. And so we we may feel really good about ourselves that, oh, good good for us, we're clear, we're not going to experience the wrath of God. Oh, au contraire. Au contraire. Because you continue, and you don't slay the old man, and you continue in your sin, you will experience some form of the wrath of God. I'm all for grace but I'm not, I'm not for a sloppy grace. I'm winning friends this morning. I can just see it on everybody's face. But there's a second little phrase here that's just equally important. It's to put away or put off. In the Greek words, it's the idea of discarding your clothing. It's like someone removing their soiled or dirty clothes at the end of the day. Some of you ladies know, some of you guys are working manual labor and they're greasy and they're, maybe they work on cars. I used to work on cars and my mother used to say to me, hey, before you come in, take those clothes off, put them in the laundry room. Oh, mom, what do you mean? No, 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 no. Get away from me with that. Now take those clothes off. She does that to you, don't you, Rafi? Yeah, 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 yeah I know. I know. Take those things off. Leave them in the laundry room. Get yourself cleaned up before you take it off. He says, put away those dirty rags of sin. And then, you know, before there were more sexual sins, but he, you know, he's an equal opportunity prophet here. Because some of you think, well, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not into that fornication stuff. I'm not into that, pat, that lustful stuff. Well, I mean, he's got a few sins for you. <laughs> Anger. Anger is smoldering bitterness. In, in my church growing up, we didn't have a lot of adulterers. We had just people who hated each other. No big deal. <laughs> wrath and resentment. That, that, that wrath is the sudden outburst of sinful anger. It flows out of an angry life and an angry heart and you just can't control it. And he says, take that off. Stop that. Slay that thing. Take the sword out and chop that head off. 
malice, moral evil, referring to the damage that can be caused through evil speech, like revenge. Slander, that's blasphemy, not just referring to God, but slandering of people. Using words to pull down, discredit, or defame. Obscene talk, filthy communication, foul, coarse humor, obscene language, low humor creeping into conversation. We don't use the mother of all curse words, but we like our coarse little jokes. And that's just, just understand something. As having been someone that one of the things uh, that I can tell you that one of my, uh, when I was stuck and I was taking my swan dive in a cesspool of sin for, that I, I, I was like a sailor. I could curse like nobody. And, and my parents never cursed, nothing. It just, I was around it and I became it and I used them all. And you know what it was a sign of? That I was so away from the Lord and that I allowed the sin to reign and my old man to have his way. And then I said, enough is enough. And I took the sword out and I started swinging and I stopped using that language. I said, no, I can't. I'm not going to use that language anymore. I got to get controls on that. And the Spirit of God helped me do that. And lying, lying, deception, deceit, speaking falsehood. And Paul says, when the ugly old man rises his head up, we take that sword out and we start swinging. And the key here is sin and sinful behavior. It is a habit. It is a habit. The old man is a creature of habit. These are sinful patterns. There are certain situations, certain conditions, certain encounters that awake the old man because it's back here and sometimes our mind is insecure and all of a sudden there's these thoughts floating around and all of a sudden it pushes the button and all of a sudden it pops up here and I start thinking a certain way and then I act and I feel a certain way. And I just fall into the rut, I fall into the behavior, the, out, the anger outbursts, the sexual sin, the whatever. The old man pops out because it is a habit in my life. And in Christ I have to dehabitualize my sin. And I have to understand, this is a habit, this is a pattern, this is, a, this is what you're learning. You're learning, because you guys are a tremendous illustration. Because you're learning something they don't know yet. And that is your sin has patterns. I'm counseling a young man right now in our church. It's taken three of us to counsel him. He's 27 years old. Three children, three different women. And as we have unraveled his life, he's up where over 100 different women in his life. And I've been able to talk to two of them. And you know what's really fascinating as we start to unravel? His rap to get at each woman is the same thing. <laughs> the same type of gal. The same type of environment. He uses the same words. He's not very creative. He can see it from a mile away. But you know what the problem is? He couldn't see it. Right here. And as we start to reel back and pull back the curtain to his own sin, he began to see his habit. And he's starting by God's grace to dehabitualize his habit. And when he's getting a certain feeling, he goes, oh, I know what that is. I know what that is. Before it starts, before sin is birthed, he's putting on the brakes, he's pulling out the sword, he's chopping off the head. Because that's what we need to do. God is not worried about our happiness, he is concerned about our holiness. In this clip, we hear Dr. Jamie talking about how we need to slay the old man. Um, that we need to start recognizing the sin in our own lives. 
and, the act, and actively start kind of changing these bad habits we have. Um, and with God's power, ultimately overcoming that sin. But Jamie brought up an interesting topic in that last segment called sloppy grace. Um, Bill, I know I've heard you dialogue about this topic before. Um, why do you think sloppy grace is becoming more and more evident in the church today? Do you think the church needs to kind of reevaluate our understanding of grace? I mean, I thought I was free. We are free in Christ. But what we try to do is we try to figure out how close we can get to the edge mm. before we really step over the boundary and begin to really delve into our sin. Uh, the best illustration I have in my own life is we had a sheep that we had for a couple months, and, and his name was Bud, and we had him in our backyard. There was lots of room for him to graze. And uh, for some reason, Bud took, chose three twigs. It was a bush. And every day I come home, and Bud would be laying down after walking around five or six times. He couldn't move because he was, he was stuck in this one area of his life. Mm. And I thought, wow, this, this stupid sheep has the biggest area to roam in, and yet he's focusing in on these, these little twigs. Mm. And that's sort of what we do in our own lives. We have all this freedom that we have in Christ, but we want to see how close we can get to the edge. And a good pastor friend of mine used to say, you can't straddle a picket fence and not get hurt. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be really careful with grace that it doesn't become sloppy. And you know what? We really do know in our hearts when we're getting to that point of crossing the line. Mm -hmm. We secure our mind. That gives us the power. And then we slay the old man, which brings me to the third thing, and that is we need strength in the new man. Look what Paul says in, chapter, in verse 10. Having put to death and put off this sin, now we're to put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. And there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then, as chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bear one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you mu must forgive. And above all else, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Just like putting off the clothes, Paul, Paul put on the clothes. And the source of this new clothes, listen, look what it is. It's being renewed in the knowledge after the Creator. We're thinking on God. We're thinking truth. We're, we're capturing these false ideas and these lies with the Word of God, and we're taking captive those thoughts, and we're controlling the things in our mind because we can. And therefore, I can put on the old, I uh, put on the new man. And the knowledge of God identifies the old man and tells me what I need to take off and what habits I need to dehabitualize. The Word of God also tells me what I need to put on and rehabitualize my life, repattern my life with the things that the Word of God says. Now, before we go any further, some of you, I hear it in your hearts, I, I hear it rattling around in your brains. You want to give an excuse. Oh, Pastor Jamie, you don't know about my life. You don't know where I've come from. I've lived in Whiting my whole life. <laughs> Paul anticipated this because look at verse 11. It seems misplaced that it's there, but it's not misplaced. You know what he's doing? He's taking away your excuses. Because he's saying, listen, there's not a Greek, nor a Jew, circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave. There's none of those things. Stop your excuses, Colossi Church. It doesn't matter what your racial background is. Stop using your race as a reason why you struggle. Stop it. Religious background, Jew or Gentile, stop it. And I came out of this, in my, in my background, I was religiously abused. Stop it. In Christ, you have freedom. You have the ability to forgive those things done in the past. My economic social status. I'm free. I was a slave. Stop it. It doesn't matter how much money you made or didn't make. Poor, rich, doesn't matter. 
Stop it. And he's just taking all the excuses away. Because once you are in Christ, you have the ability to be unstuck. So what are the new habits? There are eight of them here. Compassion. The depths, the bowels of mercy again. Start putting on compassion, feeling empathy and sympathy for people. Yeah, look what the gays are doing to our country. Don't you feel great compassion for them? And have the depths of compassion. Sure, we don't like what they're doing, but they are doing what unbelievers do. They are doing what unbeliever, what unregenerate people do. Have compassion on them. Kindness, that's goodness, even when when we don't deserve it. It's allowing grace to dominate our thinking. Humility, not thinking higher of yourself than is true. Meekness is having power under control, not being rattled or worried or having anxiety, being cool, calm, collective, not thrashing around in anxiety. Oh, the whole world is coming to an end. Warning, Will Robinson. Warning, Will Robinson. That's how Christians live their life. Put on meekness, which is God is in control. And I don't like what's going on. But God is in control. I'm calm. Patience, you put up with things. We can put up with things. Forbearance, that's bearing things. That's holding back. Even when you feel like you have the right to bring judgment. Forgiveness, I've already touched on this. The ability to say your relational and emotional debt I have with you has been cleared. You hurt me. But I have the ability, because I have been forgiven, to forgive you, and you don't ever have to even apologize to me. Done. And finally, you put on love, because that binds everything together. And you put it on, you put it on, you, you dehabitualize the old man, you slay the old man, you put on the new, you put on, you build a new habit. I like the game of golf. A golf, um, go- golf. Some people don't enjoy golf uh, for a lot of reasons. I do because it's something I can conquer. Still, <laughs> it's a battle. It's a raging battle. And the key with golf, if you didn't know this, is you know some people take a club, they go to a r- driving range, they just start whacking that thing. Or even watch TV and you think, I'll just, I'll just do what they do there. And everybody has kind of a little strange little thing. But you've got you to understand that golf is all about muscle memory. And positioning yourself properly the first time. And, and then you swing and you hit the ball. And if the ball goes off this way, you know, okay, I got I to gotta adjust. I got to get the right feel. And you hit it again and it goes off this way. Okay, what did I do wrong that time? And, I'm over. and, then, and then you hit one and it goes straight. Oh, how did I just do that? <laughs> well, let me, let me see if I can do it again. And boom, I can. Oh, wait a minute. How my feet were a certain way, my body was a certain way, my arms were a certain way. Let me concentrate. Let me get that habit. Let me hit it again and again and again. And let me get the habit down. And then you just change your club, but you never change your swing or the habit. You let the club do the work, and you just have the same swing. And that's the key with golf. Muscle memory. Doing it over and over and over again. And you know how you get unstuck? You take this new man and the things that God expects of you and you keep doing it over. And I put on compassion. And I forgive. And I show kindness when I haven't been shown kindness. And I bind it all up with love. 
and I keep doing. And I scull one off every now and then. Oh, let me readjust. <laughs> the old man got out of my bag and got into my hands. And I go back. And that's it. That, and I play with Phil Tuttle. I'm all over the place, you know. <laughs> habits, habits, habits. And he, fi he finishes up with this. You stay with the master. You stay with the master. He says this in verse 15, 16, 17, and I'm done. He says here, how do you stay? No drifting. This isn't a one-hit wonder. Let the peace of Christ rule your heart. The word peace there really has to do with contentment. Be content with Christ. Don't go looking for other things. This is where we get in trouble with our habits. This is where we get in trouble with the Christian life. We go wandering, looking for other things. We're not at peace with Christ. He is my all and all. That's all I need. And then he says here in verse 16, and let the word of Christ dwell with you richly. He goes back to it. <laughs> you secure the mind. You secure it, you better set up a guard. You secure the prison, don't send the prison guards away on a vacation. Keep coming around the Word of God. I know this is hard for some of you because you come here and you get this fantastic Bible teaching by these unbelievable teachers up here. <laughs> you know what some of you have said over the years to me? Pastor Jamie, I, 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 I just love coming here. I hear a really wonderful teaching, but I got to go back. My pastor hardly even cracks open a Bible. I get it. I know they're out there. I can't tell you what to do. I know if it was me, I would not be anywhere that the Word of God is not lifted high and, and held up with authority and preached without apology. And, and I, I don't care if my family and I have been going to this church 30 years. I need for my soul, I don't want to get stuck. I have to be every... I have a guy in my church, James Strabell. He comes to me every Sunday. He says, Pastor, you do it today. Do what you need to do. I said, James, I will. He said, no, you got to understand. I need it. Got you, James. I need it so that we all would, oh, like Paul says, that the word of Christ would dwell in us richly. And then he finally says this in verse 17. And whatever you do in word and deed, do everything to the name of Christ, consciously saying to myself that my life is not my own. I am being held accountable. I bear the name of the one who has saved me and therefore I need to walk in him. I am a representative of Jesus Christ. Most of us in the Christian life, we have never learned how to get unstuck. But do you realize that Paul spent a great amount of his teaching on helping people understand? You know why? He had to go through it. Do you think his murderous ways when he came to know Christ just went away? Do you don't think that he battled and struggled? This is the man in Romans who said, I know what I want to do, but I don't want to do it. But I do want to do it, and I don't want to do it, and I stop it. I try not to do it, and it's driving me crazy. And Paul, you're driving me crazy by how you wrote that. <laughs> and you can hear his own personal anguish there. And here's the man who wrote us who says, you want to have victory? You want to get unstuck? Secure your minds. Can you imagine the memories that Paul had to a sponge from his mind with the Word of God? The guilt. And then take that sword out and you slay the old man. Stop the nonsense. Whip that sword out. Be a brave heart and chop the head off. But don't just stop there. Strengthen the new man. Get those godly habits going. Hit that thing down the middle of the fairway and do it over and over and over again. And then stay with the master. 
It's not a one-hit wonder. You've got to cultivate that. Cultivate that. Don't, don't become discontent with Christ. He is our all in all. Bill, you made a very interesting statement when Dr. Jamie finished this particular message. Um, you said, Jamie, you should be proud. That was a Keswick message. Mm. Um, at America's Keswick, we hear a lot about the exchanged life, especially with the addiction recovery ministries. But I know a lot of people, and even myself for a while, that's maybe a concept we haven't heard or maybe understand. Um, why do you think the victorious Christian life mes message is so important to you and to this ministry? I think there's so many Christians that have tried to do Christianity on their own, and that's why they're frustrated. Mm. I can't live this life apart from Jesus Christ living that life through me. And that's, that's where the exchange comes because, you, you know, we, we can try, try, try. We, we think if we read the Bible more, if we pray more, if we witness more, if we do this, we do that, we're going to receive more of God's favor. We got the whole package when Jesus died on the cross and extended salvation to us. Mm. I can't do it on my own. I can't live one day apart from him living his life through me. And that's, when people understand that message, that really sets them free to live a life of victory. It's not I, but Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, Christ now lives his life through me. Mm -hmm. Well, that concludes this month's podcast. Bill, how can someone listen to Dr. Jamie's full message series? Well, remember, the series was called Unstuck. And if you'd like to see the full series, I want to encourage you to visit our website at www.americaskeswick.org. And I'd certainly love to connect with any of our listeners. They can write me at bwelty at americaskeswick.org. Great. And I'd like to invite everyone to tune in next month. We're going to be featuring a message from Dr. Phil Tuttle, um, who shared the platform mm. with Jamie this week. And he'll be talking about a message on Mary. And uh, I even know personally, he really opened my eyes to mm. what an incredible young lady she was and how we all can really dive in and learn from her experiences. And if this message this month impacted you in a special way, I'd like to welcome you to uh, comment on our YouTube channel or email us at info at americaskeswick.org. Um, and don't forget, we have tons of special events happening all year round, not just in the summer. But um, if you'd like to learn more about what's happening here at America's Keswick, again, you can visit our website, call us, like us on Facebook. Um, and we'd love to have you share in everything that we do here. Um, I want to thank you for joining us and ask you to keep discovering victory.